today. Uh, we have uh, Jean-Pascal Vanny Purcell, uh, who's the vice chair of the IPCC. And we also have Yuba Sakona, who is from the Working Group 3 uh, co-chair of the IPCC. That's the working group that deals in, with mitigation. Today, we're talking with our guests here about what are the implications of the IPCC fifth assessment report for Australia. Firstly, Jean-Pascal, can you just give us a quick rundown of what the key messages are from the fifth assessment report? Well, I would say the key, the four key overall messages as first that human influence on the climate system is clear. The second is that if emissions continue at the present pace, there'll be increased impacts and the likelihood of severe impacts having pervasive effects and sometimes irreversible effects affecting first the poor but later everybody uh, will only increase. Third, uh, that there are many opportunities uh, to address this problem by integrating mitigation and adaptation and also the pursuit of other societal objectives uh, to the benefit of everyone. And finally, that humanity today has, has in present tense, the means to cope with the, uh, the problem and to build uh, a more resilient uh, future. Yeah, there's some very powerful messages there um, which uh, resonate a lot with the, the current circumstances in Australia. And so we'll go into those a little bit more um, soon. But, but Yuba, and what are your key messages from the fifth assessment? The fifth assessment report on mitigation, we start with looking at the uh, trend of emissions and uh, they are growing unprecedentedly despite all the uh, policy that has been undertaken so far. And we have seen from the last 40 years, more than half of the emission happened since uh, 1750, uh, the last 40 years. And then that is mainly driven by the economic uh, growth and the population growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as the policymakers have indicated to look at the two degrees target, and uh, if we are continue uh, the, the trend, at the end of the century will be beyond uh, 1,000 uh, gigaton uh, by the end of the century. And then the policymakers have indicated the two degrees. And then the two degrees, we uh, look at number of scenarios and then we are able to reach the two degrees and it will be number of challenges at economical challenges, institutional challenges, technological challenges. But however, we will be able to reach this if we start as soon as possible decarbonization of the entire economy, starting with the energy sector. Mm. And then the cost of uh, such decarbonization is uh, not very high. It will, uh, based on the, some of the assessments, because there is a number of uh, economic assessments, it's only uh, 0. Uh, 0. Uh, point two, two of the uh, global economy. And then this looking at the consequences is not a very big deal. Mm. In indeed. So you mentioned decarbonisation pathways there. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about what you see as the key pathways for countries like Australia, so developed countries, and, and maybe what some of the co-benefits of effective decarbonisation may be? One area that is, uh, uh, there is uh, a combination of uh, how you decarbonize the economy, starting with the uh, energy efficiency. There is a wide range of possibilities from different sectors, starting from the building sector, the industrial sector, the uh, transport sector, a wide range of possibility of decarbonization, uh, of, the, uh, of uh, energy efficiency on uh, those different sectors. And there is a massive deployment possibility of deployment of renewables. Mm -hmm. And then the cost of the renewable are uh, uh, decreasing dramatically. And then in many areas in the world, it uh, uh, is cost competitive with uh, fossil fuel based uh, energy systems. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we are seeing also from uh, the, uh, the one of the big problems we are facing with the renewables is uh, the intermittency. And then the, the cost of the storage system, the batteries are getting uh, uh, very dramatically uh, reduced. 
and at the same time very efficient. And then those give some perspective. And then there is a new uh, emerging technologies and then we have to look at the possibility how they can offer. They are not at yet certain, such as carbon uh, capture and sequestration, and then with bioenergy, and then with afforestation, all those give the possibilities, but we have to start with energy efficiency, renewables, and then to look at the uh, policies that uh, lead to low carbon to zero carbon in the entire economy. And then for the case of the uh, low income country, such as the African country, give to them a tremendous opportunity to address the energy access issue because the uh, scattered population, the low uh, level of energy demand, and then the renewable are adequate to deal with that uh, kind of uh, situation so that a majority of the people will have access to energy at the same time uh, will lead to a low carbon society or zero carbon society. Mm. Very, very interesting. And John Pascal, can you talk to us a little bit about the sort of co-benefits and how co-benefits from both adaptation and mitigation may feed into sort of other national uh, priorities? It, it's really a very uh, promising avenue because if you can uh, kill, uh, maybe, the, the, maybe the comparison is not good, but kill two birds with one stone, mm -hmm. we shouldn't kill birds, but if you can do that, yep. you, 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 you can be more efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for example, um, you know, when you look at air quality, for example, mm. um, bad air quality in many cities, many parts of the world, uh, often comes from the usage of fossil fuel as well. Uh, the bad combustion, too much tra uh, traffic congestion, too little public transport, that kind of things. And uh, it's the same cause, if you stand back, as, as the cause of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So there are ways to address um, greenhouse gas emissions and reduce them and at the same time improve air quality by reduce air pollution and in and, and, and that way you have a very short term benefit because the air quality um, benefits um, are, are seen immediately and, and also a longer term, medium to longer term benefit in terms of reduce emissions to help protect climate. That's just one example. Another example is, is increased uh, energy efficiency. Uh, when you when you uh, have a higher energy efficiency efficiency you reduce energy bills uh, which is good for the economy which is good for people because they have more money to do something else mm -hmm. uh, and it also helps to to reduce emissions so there are several ways to 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 uh, uh, to meet different goals uh, by clever policies mm -hmm. if i may add on that if you take the case of africa there is 600,000 people uh, dead by per year uh, related to uh, short-lived climate pollutant. Mm. And then uh, by eliminating that, because that related, and then also the all uh, uh, health-related issues, and then by eliminating the short-lived climate pollutant, uh, and then by eliminating the fact of cooking with uh, uh, dirty fuels, and then that will help solve the problem, and then it will save also life, particularly women and kids. Mm. Yeah, so it's a, a really important story here about um, investing in change uh, can bring additional benefits of different types. And, uh, and so I think that's a very, very important story in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation, its emission reductions, but also some reflections on how it may relate to adaptation that's adapting to the changes we're already seeing and may see more in the future. Well, a, a very classic example, maybe it's not the best example, but it's an example everybody understands, is that um, you could adapt to, to a warmer climate with much more heat waves, etc., by installing much more air conditioning everywhere. And it's a form of adaptation. But if you do that, of course, you'll in increase uh, the energy consumption and increase the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are ways to design buildings and uh, uh, to, to improve the, um, the vegetation in, in cities, for example, to, 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 to get to the same effect of decreasing the temperature, which is a, a kind of adaptation, prevent too much warming in cities in particular, um, and, and have adaptation which doesn't contribute uh, so much to, to increasing emissions. So there are ways to integrate adaptation and mitigation in a clever manner, again, to, to get multiple benefits. That's right. And, uh, and, 
and also the real question here is if we are not reaching the limit of adaptation in many places in the world because adaptation has a limit and then there is a big difference between adaptation and mitigation because mitigation we, we need incentive we need clever policy in order to uh, initiate but adaptation we have no choice we have to start it as we have seen and adaptation are happening in many parts of the world and then the real question actually looking at the trend of the emissions if we are not reaching the limit of adaptation so there's a, a case for both adaptation and mitigation to be starting now and, and benefits that can be experienced right now as well as benefits that can be experienced in the future. And, and those, those are it's, it's an important equation. So how do you see that sort of equation of, of costs and benefits now and in the future sort of playing out in terms of the discussions at Paris and, and just reflecting on how countries like Australia, without being country specific, but uh, uh, developed countries may actually reflect on their targets at Paris and, and how do you think they're, they're coming? You know, we've got a range of targets from around 20% up to much more ambitious ones, 50% by 2030. And how do you see uh, countries sort of starting to frame that given those costs and benefits? You know, it, this is very much related to the risk management approach that the IPCC has taken in its uh, latest report. I mean, it's a question of balance. Yeah. Uh, as Yuba said, you, you have to balance costs uh, in the mitigation area, investment that you make to, to get benefits a little later in terms of reduced energy bills and a, a reduced uh, uh, emissions of um, greenhouse gases. And the cost of impacts uh, and the cost of adaptation um, which, which would increase mm -hmm. um, very significantly if not enough mitigation is made. Uh, and, and it's a matter of balance. Uh, it's also a matter of when you pay for what, because if we invest more mm -hmm. today uh, to mitigate, we will have, and our children will have less to pay to more mm -hmm. to adapt uh, to the extent adaptation is still possible, because as Yuba said, adaptation has its limits as well. Yeah. And uh, I think it's uh, important and what we have seen is encouraging, at least in the case of some of the developing countries. I just came from uh, Cairo, Egypt, uh, mm -hmm. four days ago, where we had a discussion with the uh, uh, Bureau of the African Minister of uh, Environment and then they are preparing the Paris conference. And uh, Africa is uh, initiating a proposal that is unprecedentedly uh, ambitious, because that is from now to 2020 uh, to add new uh, uh, additional power of renewables of 10 gigawatt. Mm. And then this is quite ambitious in the continent. And then at least a minimum of 20 gigawatt of renewables. And then by 2030, between 2020 and 2030, and then uh, a minimum of 100 gigawatt additional in the, the continent of renewable. And it is quite ambitious. And then because it addressing also a fundamental problem of the continent that is the adaptation because most of the people are not seeing renewable as being one of the critical elements for addressing adaptation mm -hmm. related to water, related to agricultural sector, related to most of the livelihood that is uh, uh, where adaptation is critical, is fundamental. And then this is quite ambitious. And I, and I think that also those kind of ambition is needed from different parts of the world. So it's a, a lot of it comes down to sort of investment in, in different options. Um, and when you're talking with industry, um, how, how do you find industry sort of responding to the, the, the issues that you're raising? Well, in many parts of the world, larger and larger sections of the industry see that it's to their benefit uh, to, to, to think about the future in the long term because it's what their consumers, their clients, uh, uh, pay attention to and um, being very efficient with resources and energy is also good business. So an increasing fraction of the business community is actually demanding uh, a good framework for action. For example, many, not all, but many are asking to have a price on carbon, for mm -hmm. example, um, to, to, to the condition that it would be a fair, uh, done in a fair way and, and extend to, to their competitors as well. Uh, so there is no competitiveness distortion. But the, the business community is, is moving ahead uh, uh, in, in the, uh, the area of climate protection. 
and, and not only in the mitigation area, but uh, also to uh, an increasing amount uh, in the adaptation area as well. Yeah. Because nice. most of the infrastructure also in the adaptation infrastructure, engineering adaptation, mm. the business sector is playing a critical role. And then for them, investing now is uh, cost effective than uh, waiting later. Waiting later mm. it might be out of reach and then they will lose their competitiveness. Mm. Uh, very, very important message. Well, just to wrap up, I'm just wondering if you could give us a, a very quick, like one sentence um, summary of, of how you feel uh, about this issue and, and the sort of messages you want to send to our viewers. You know, I'm I'm very optimistic about uh, the the, uh, the the deal uh, in Paris. As far as uh, the fact of having a deal at the end of the year, I think there will be a deal uh, because the understanding, the awareness, and the IPCC has helped for that. That there is really a problem we need to cope with is much higher now than ten years ago. I'm a little less optimistic that that deal will solve all the issues at once. Mm. Um, there will probably be needs for further negotiations and further progress in the future. But if there is a deal at the end of the year, and I think there will be one, uh, things will be able to be built uh, on it to go further because uh, probably the sum of all the uh, contributions uh, announced will not be enough to keep the warming below two degrees and humanity will need to, do, uh, to go further than what has been announced up to now. Okay. As Jean-Pascal, I'm also optimistic for a number of reasons because we will have next September in Paris an agreement on the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And those goals include in New York, uh, in New York uh, Sustainable Development uh, Goals, 17 goals. And so one of the goal, goal seven related to energy, sustainable energy for all. And then goal 13 is related to climate. And then that give also a, a good indication, a good push for aligning climate change and sustainable development. And then, but the more we wait, the more difficult it will be with us. And then we have, we do not have, we have, we do not have to uh, leave the burden to our kids. Mm. A good note to finish on. Jean-Pascal and Yuba, um, thank you very much. And ANU wishes you a, a very productive and happy stay here. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.